Good morning. Good morning again to everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of the uh, Tata Cornell Institute, uh, Institute of Economic Growth, and International Food Policy Research Institute for attending this important meeting, the development of biofortified <coughs> crops, value chains for nutritional security in India, in South Asia. And I can say that this is a, some, it's a unique kind of you know, uh, workshop where we are not discussing more on production aspects uh, or consumption aspects, but we are the thinking more on the value chain to complete from production till it reaches to the consumers. I would like to express, uh, before we start, I would like to express uh, sincere thanks to Dr. Chandra, who initiated this uh, discussion that we should have something on biofortified uh, value chains, and Prabhu to for further motivating us to take up further. And Binu supported a lot um, in developing our detailed plan. So I will just give you a brief overview of this workshop. And we have three broad objectives of this workshop. One is uh, we have, you know, we would like to have value chain development for making biofortified food crops by overcoming existing bottlenecks in the system. So biofortification is a new pathway of reducing malnutrition in South Asian countries or in African countries, wherever we have undernourished population. So we would like to see that how we can evolve an efficient, sustainable, inclusive, and business-friendly value chain. What may be the role of various kinds of institutions, like farmer producer organizations, contract farming, or in any forms of value chain development. So this is one of the objectives which we would like to deliberate on. The second is uh, what sorts of policy options are needed to expand the production and consumption of biofortified crops so that we reduce uh, the malnutrition and overcome the burden of uh, this uh, undernourishment. And the third is that what sorts of cross-country experiences we can draw. A lot of efforts are going on in Africa. Extensively, value chains have been evolved. So what cross-country experiences we can learn in South Asia? So in terms of various kinds of crops, in terms of nutrition, in terms of regions, so how we can go forward in developing strong value chains in the region. So how can we, through policies, how can we link it with the social safety net programs, how we can go for more investment in creating infrastructure. So those all issues we would like to delve in this um, the one day uh, workshop. So this is a whole uh, food system from we have to understand when we are developing value chain, we need to understand both uh, supply side as well as demand side. So what are the drivers from the supply side and what are from the demand side and how we can link the supply side and demand side. So the whole value chain we have to understand and we, I am sure that we will be deliberating on all these issues in different presentations. So I'm just adding uh, five, uh, you know, five key challenges in value chain development of these uh, biofortified crops. So this we would like to deliver during the day. So first thing is the consumer awareness about biofortified food. So whether the consumers are aware about it. The second is the acceptance by the consumer, whether he accepts it or not. And third condition is the access to biofortified crops. How we are able to make access to the biofortified and the affordability the price issues are very important so there are you no know, confusions with between um, the um, the biofortified crops versus gmos so that doubt we have to clear many people those who do not understand the agriculture they are not clear about whether it is gm or biofortification is either through your traditional breeding program or used bio, with biotechnology or genetic engineering. It's not the genetically modified commodities. So this, this I think the consumers who are accepting it, they should be clear, or the policy maker also to be clear. The second is the biofortification versus fortification. So government is making all efforts for fortification. So whether it is most effective, cost effective, efficient way, or the fortification, or both. So that's, this we will be 
dealing and this is really a challenge for all of us and how we can create more demand for biofortified food that's another challenge especially in areas where more micronutrient deficiency especially of iron zinc manganese so how we can create more demand so what sorts of institutional arrangement policies or information dissemination mechanisms are useful for creating more demand the this the second one is back <laughs> Uh, the second one is human health and safety concerns. So how the consumers may be concerned about the toxicity. So if they take excess of zinc, excess of magnesium, excess of any other any nutrient, so so these health issues, safety issues are to be. I think I'm sure that this we are discussing during the day. Third is that if you have to you know have a better market, so this there should be product differentiation. So from low uh, nutrient crop or food uh, distinguishing with the high or biofortified crops. So there will be the always consumers will have the trade-off between price and the value of nutrition. So that is also very important. Here role of labeling is very important. When we have to product differentiate, then labeling is important. So how are we going to do it? This is a challenge for all of us on developing value chain. Then seed chain to food chain. So we first we have to develop a strong food chain or food system. You know, if you look to the Eastern India, the adoption of uh, improved varieties is still very, very low. So how we can introduce the biofortified crops in the Eastern India where majority of the population is undernourished. So developing a strong seed chain and then integrating with the food chain. And can we think of linking this with the first, many of the social safety net programs like midday meal scheme or PDS or any uh, or integrated child development program? Then what are the government incentives to develop value chains, institutions as well as infrastructure? So these are the five key challenges we may have. Uh, we may be deliberating in the in the whole day, and our uh, we would like to have the three broad outcomes of this workshop by the uh, end of the day. We would like to have pathways to develop value chains, what are the different pathways and which may be more effective, efficient in different uh, regions for different commodities. This will vary from you know, food grains to perishable commodities like vegetables, like uh, sweet potato or potato. So the, how we evolve this uh, uh, value chains and identify research and investment priorities. This is not for breeding and other purpose, the identifying research and investment priorities for more, for evolving value chains for uh, this um, biofortified crop. And what role public policy or the private sector can play, how um, civil society organization can be involved in developing value chains. So thank you very much. I look forward for uh, deliberations here and, <clears throat> and fruitful discussion. I'm sure that we will come out with a strong recommendation to promote uh, the biofortified crops and uh, develop value chains so that it will help in reducing undernourishment in areas where people are deprived of uh, nutritive food. Thank you very much. So we have, um, we have next one, next presentation next uh, is uh, by Dr. Chandra. He's on conceptualization of the workshop. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Dr. Joshi, Professor Pingali, distinguished scholars and friends. See, the new millennium kicked off with the global efforts to combat poverty and malnutrition through millennium development goals and subsequently sustainable development goals. The United Nations proclaimed 2016 to 25 as the decade of action on nutrition. Several governments in South Asia, including India, are making concerted efforts in this direction. Economists have been making efforts to respond to these concerns by putting forward the case for a nutrition-sensitive food system, which extends the conventional definition of food system to cover nutrient intake at household and individual levels. This is important as hidden hunger adversely impacts 2 billion rural population in developing countries and indirectly causes humongous disease burden, even as food security is achieved at the national levels. Markets fail to bring about dietary diversity for nutritional security, especially in developing countries with lower level of structural transformation. In these countries, biological transformation of food, biological fortification of food has been emerging as a, one of the major means of achieving nutritional security 
and is proven to be simple, cost effective and sustainable. The World Health Organization has proposed this as a public health strategy as part of a comprehensive approach. We have now documented evidence of successful biofortification interventions in several crops like rice, wheat, sorghum, perlumilate, beans and sweet potato in several countries. According to the Harvest Plus of the International Food Policy Research Institute, 20 million people grew and ate biofortified crops in the world in the year 2016. The returns in their development far outweigh the investment in that saving a healthy life here is possible with as low as $3 in India. However, this is not without a, you know, challenges. So we need, you know, the international development community <coughs> has to work hard to realize this potential. Especially, I will flag one. The segregation of biofortified crops and foods stands out as the crux of the problem. Also, there are serious challenges at various nodes of the biofortified crop value chains and need institutional mechanisms and policy in support for development of these value chains. This workshop will deliberate on these issues with two each of technical and panel sessions. And I will, will have a mix of academic, industry, and policy perspectives. It brings together all the stakeholders with an overall objective of mainstreaming biofortified food to fight hidden hunger. I hope you would enjoy and enrich the deliberations. And before I close, I wish to thank Professor Pingali and Dr. Joshi for collaborating with us at the Institute of Economic Growth. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chandra. And now request Dr. Prabhu Pingali to give his remarks on nutritional security through biofortification. Um, thank you, Dr. Joshi. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure on behalf of the Tata Cornell Institute to welcome you to this meeting. Uh, we are delighted to work with IEG and with IFPRI uh, in organizing this event. <clears throat> Let me start by saying why should the Tata Cornell Institute be interested in this area? Um, because it's not obvious that we have a particular role here. Um, the Tata Cornell Institute's primary focus is on enhancing the supply of more nutritious food uh, for populations that are deprived of essential nutrients and populations that are at risk of high levels of malnutrition. So our emphasis, the emphasis of our entire program is on increasing the supply of diversity of food, in improving the quality of diets of consumers, especially for the poor. And in that sense, a lot of our work focuses on fruits, vegetables, livestock products, pulses, etc. And those are the broad spectrum of uh, a more nutritious diet that one would aspire to. <clears throat> but we believe that biofortified crops have a role to play as you think about a more nutritious food system. And, and it's important to identify what that role is. And so when we think about biofortified foods, how do we see them fitting within this broader concept of a, a nutrition-sensitive food system? Um, first, I think um, one would imagine a large part of the focus of the biofortification program, the Harvest Plus program, is on disadvantaged communities. It's on communities uh, which are either very remote farming communities that have very little market access and therefore access to a more nutritious diet is limited. And in that context, bringing in biofortified food, zinc fortified wheat or iron fortification or vitamin A, fortified uh, sweet potato, etc., make sense in targeting those populations. And, and there are certain constraints to that. Obviously, constraints to these populations getting these new technologies and these new seeds is similar to the constraints these populations have had in, in, in getting Green Revolution-related technologies. So there's going to be a big challenge there. And that's something that I know that IFPRI and Harvest Plus and ICAR and 
a lot of other organizations are concerned about and trying to work through. But that's one set of issues uh, that we'll certainly be talking about today. The other set of issues around disadvantaged communities is how do you improve access to food for poor, especially in rural areas, and more nutritious food. And here, uh, there's been quite a lot of talk about how do you bring biofortified crops into the safety net programs in India. The PDS program, the midday meal program, etc. And what are the challenges around that? We've talked quite a bit about how to enter the PDS program or the midday meal program. The challenge is who's going to provide the supply? Somebody has to supply these biofortified crops that then go into these programs. And that supply chain is not yet well established. And, and it's not just an infrastructure problem. It's also a problem of not having the incentives at the farm level to switch to these biofortified crops and then provide them into the, uh, the Food Corporation of India infrastructure, etc., and then feed into the, the safety net programs. So there's a whole set of challenges around that, and, and obviously there's a lot of discussion around it, but that's an area where I think a lot more needs to be done. But what really excites me about biofortified food is to look beyond disadvantaged populations. I think where the big growth opportunity is coming is to look at urban demand for food. You know, the rate at which urbanization is happening in India today, by 2030, we'll see more than half of Indian population in urban areas. And, and that's more than, uh, I don't know, 600 million or so that will be living in urban areas. And feeding urban populations is going to be a big challenge. But the other part of the story is that uh, urban populations are becoming increasingly conscious of better diets and increasingly conscious of, of more healthy diets. And I think capturing that market through biofortified foods is, is a huge growth opportunity for biofortification work. So not just looking at the poor and the disadvantaged, but looking more at consumers, the consumer, <laughs> urban consumer end of the spectrum. And when you do that, there are lots of challenges. Now, one big challenge is how do you create differentiated products? How do you, how do you differentiate between rice and biofortified rice? They look the same. How do you provide that product differentiation in a way that consumers are willing to pay more for that higher quality, more nutritious grain, etc.? And that Product differentiation issues is something we have to really think through as you think about the value chain. The other is how do you feed this into the food industry that's increasingly engaging urban consumers. Much of the discussion on biofortification is at the seed industry level, integrating it with the seed industry. And that's an, a very essential role uh, that the seed industry plays in promoting biofortified crops. But the food industry hasn't been as much engaged. And I think the food industry and looking at biofortified crops and looking at ways in which you can use them within developing new food products, etc., is, is another major growth opportunity you know, for biofortification as you look to the future, I think. And, but as you do that, and as we look about the growing demand for food, the growing demand for more nutritious food, the, the supply side constraints will come back to, to be a big issue that will haunt us for a long time. How do you build the <coughs> supply chains in a way that smallholder farmers can benefit from them, can integrate into these supply chains? How do you aggregate, create aggregation models for smallholders? to link into these supply chains. So there, as we talk today, the value chain issues are value chain issues that look at what's happening at the farm level, what's happening at the market level, the wholesale, the retail market level, then what happens at the food industry level, 
and ultimately what happens at the consumer level. We need to bring all of this expertise together. And, and as we do that, I think we'll have a much better understanding on the future prospects for biofortified crops and biofortified food within this country. That's why I'm very excited about this workshop and I look forward to a great deliberation today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for raising several uh, issues. I now request uh, Dr. Binu Jerian, who is the country manager, Harvest Press Program, uh, to give the keynote address. I'm sure he will be flagging several issues on production as well as on supply chain. Binu. So good morning, everyone. Uh, Harvest Plus is extremely thankful to uh, TCI, IFRI, and IEG for giving this opportunity to be here. Uh, agriculture linkages has a huge potential to make affordable nutrition uh, available in a substantial way. Harvest Plus has been on a mission to reduce this gap between agriculture and nutrition for the last 15 years. Uh, we have been able to uh, uh, garner some evidences related to agriculture, related to implementation, related to nutrition impact assessment all these years, and which proves or creates a proof of concept that uh, uh, biofortification is doable, it is scalable. Next. So at the same time, agriculture also has challenge. The biggest challenge that uh, I feel is the climate change, the impact of climate change on crop nutrients, and uh, that trickles down to the impact on food systems, especially at the global level, local level, regional level, on scale, as well as on sustainability. And that trickles down on the effect of uh, nutrition uh, and health of the population. So with that uh, setting in mind, biofortification still has a potential of, uh, of, de of uh, developing uh, more nutritious food systems at that point of time. So with that setting in mind, I would like to tell us that uh, with 2 billion population suffering from malnutrition, uh, globally about one in three, and uh, according to the World Bank reports, India loses about uh, $12 billion in GDP uh, to micronutrient deficiencies and vitamin A. And so with that, uh, it, it, it also has an impact on not only on health and nutrition, but it also has an impact on the socioeconomic indicators and development of the country. So what I would like to now emphasize, what are the existing interventions that is, uh, uh, that is available in the car? So uh, one of the ideal way setting is to have uh, dietary diversity. But as you all know, dietary diversity, affordable dietary diversity, nutritious diet is still a challenge in to millions of, uh, millions of population uh, globally. And uh, most of these population depend on cereal crops for their calorific need. The other two uh, interventions are supplementation and fortification that have been existing uh, for some time. The fourth puzzle that we are working on is biofortification. And biofortification is a process of uh, developing uh, nutrients-dense or nutrients-rich staple food crops uh, through plant breeding, which are not only higher in uh, nutrition but higher in yield, with uh, all the farmers' preferred traits that farmers look for. And if it is eaten on a daily basis, it, uh, it develops or creates measurable health impacts. The focus of the uh, program is on three micronutrients, vitamin A, zinc, and uh, iron. The distinct advantage biofortification has over other interventions is that it is targeted initially at, uh, at the population that requires the most. That's the rural approach. And, uh, and that's where biofortification starts somewhere at an urban, peri-urban area where there's a reasonable amount of distribution and which uh, distribution which from which distribution which helps to move from A to B, and uh, with the building surpluses, farm surpluses, biofortification has the potential to move from uh, to urban and semi-urban markets, 
And that's what I feel sometimes is that uh, fortification, biofortification will cross its paths. In terms of cost effectiveness, biofortification uh, investments are initially uh, a focus on its front-loaded developing of germplasm, breeding pipelines. And once that is done, the investment tapers off compared to other interventions where you have to invest the same amount year on year. It is sustainable that we believe because once these germplasms are developed, the varieties can be developed, the trait, the nutrient trait stays in the germplasm. It's something like, you know, 60s when uh, the dwarf wheat was developed. It stays in the system, the varieties developed are dwarf in nature. The next. So Harvest Plus has been uh, working uh, in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. It's an interdisciplinary program, works with academics, private, public resource institutes in uh, three continents in approximately eight countries globally, directly and indirectly in about 12 countries. It's a part of the CGIR uh, a program on agriculture for uh, uh, nutrition and health. And, uh, and the overarching goal of Harvest Plus is to reach touch upon at least 1 billion people by 2030 by biofortified crops. So three questions were asked when the biofortification idea was brainstormed. The first question was that, is it really possible to breed uh, plants with higher minerals and vitamin? And the second question was that, if it is possible to develop, then is it really possible that these would be bioavailable, it can make some impact in the human body when it's consumed. And the third question, what nutritionists asked was that, if you develop these varieties, will the farmers really adopt it? Dr. Havdi Buis uh, was the recipient of the 2016 World Food Prize uh, for his pioneering work in the last 15 to 20 years uh, in the field of biofortification. Today, there are more than 290 varieties of biofortified released in three continents. In 2017, end of 2017, 29 varieties of biofortified crops are released. And we work with about 440 partners in about 20 countries. India is one of, one of the countries where biofortification research has been uh, invested. Apart from India, China and Brazil invest on biofortification. So, uh, just for the people who are very new uh, to this, uh, how does biofortification really, uh, the process of biofortification? So, the nutritionists, socioeconomists, plant breeders uh, come together in order first to identify the target population. And uh, they, depending on the consumption patterns, depending on the crop production, they set a nutrient target. And depending on the nutrient target, the plant breeders go back to their germplasm and they mine to understand the, the variability of the minerals in their germplasm. And then the breeding of the crop starts and this is tested at multi-location for the stability of the traits. And once these crops are developed, the nutritionists evaluate the retention of the micronutrients and uh, the absorption. In, in nutrition terms, they call it efficacy study, control studies. And then these crops are released for uh, growing for the population. And once that is done, then uh, different skill sets of people are required to drive the promotion and adoption of this, depending on the infrastructure that you have in the country, private sector, public sector, NGOs, community organization. And once it is in the field, then after uh, five or six years, the nutrition measurements are done in the target population. So if you were to look at this by design, biofortification requires a, a multidisciplinary approach. And what I would like to emphasize is that it is an evidence-based approach. So that, uh, the primary focus of Harvest Plus uh, is three crops in Asia, that is rice, wheat, that is with zinc, and iron pearl millet with iron. Uh, in Asia, we work in Bangladesh, Pakistan, and uh, India. And uh, four crops, that is three are vitamin A crops, and one iron crop in Africa in four countries. So initial challenges when biofortification started was how do we measure, measure micronutrients uh, in, in, in grains or in plants? 
uh, initially our, 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 t our tools were low throughput tools. It took for some time for Harvest Plus to zero in high throughput tools like XRF machines and to bring down the cost of, uh, of a breeding program. And uh, uh, we, we, under the biofortification program, have supported national agriculture centers with XRF machines, helped them to calibrate, uh, uh, build up uh, gold standards for, uh, uh, for uh, testing and evaluation of these biofortified uh, uh, crops. And this has also brought in uh, more efficiency in terms of breeding programs. We also help uh, seed companies to test their uh, germplasm so that they can map out the germplasm to understand uh, the mineral variabilities uh, available in the germplasm. And we also help the uh, seed companies also to test their advanced pipelines so that it brings efficiency of the breeding program. We support seed companies also to develop their own varieties so that they can develop their own varieties. This helps in creating a long-term long sustainability. So as you know, sometimes, this is just for information, you know, if you were to look at the, the picture in the middle, uh, initially when uh, some of the programs like rice started, it was with iron. But over the years, what we found was that iron depositors largely present in the outer layer, whereas zinc deposits are in the middle, is in the endosperm. So the more you wash or more you polish rice, the iron depletes, whereas zinc is more stable because it's an endosperm. Mm. So it took some time for Harvest Plus <coughs> to understand that. So the program then shifted from iron to zinc. So most of our rice and wheat program is now focused on zinc. So in order to do that, in order to do that, the overarching uh, uh, the strategy of Harvest Plus is to create a sustainable market, to work across the value chain the initial focus has been to develop product, to create partnership, to develop, uh, to create capacities, seed capacities, and then uh, create marketing, so that marketing strategies, advocacy for favorable policies. So in order to do that, uh, Harvest Plus uh, established a partnership program uh, in collaboration with the national agriculture systems, uh, seed companies, uh, progressive farmers, NGOs. We work with about 70 partners in the country. The overarching objective of the research partnership is to exchange the germplasm, uh, test it out, and then get it released. And uh, the, there are three strategies that we focus on, uh, on research and development of product creation. Uh, one is a, a short-term strategy. A short-term strategy is a strategy to identify varieties of products which are already in the seed value system and to identify that and then promote it as nutritious varieties. We have been, it needs a little bit of luck. We were successful initially with, the, uh, with pearl millet. We have been uh, able to identify a product which has already been in the seed system and then we promote it as nutritious or biofortified crops. The medium term strategy is to, uh, to do plant breeding which takes about six to seven to eight years. And uh, the long-term strategy is uh, what we call as mainstreaming. How do we generate more germplasm uh, with higher micronutrients? Or how do we move germplasm to more uh, micronutrient sites so that after a long time, maybe after five or 10 years, when you have this germplasm, then you can, any variety which is developed is a nutritious variety. So that's the long-term goal of Harvest Plus to create sustainability. So in similarly, we also have a partnership for delivery program. And uh, the large part of the objective of uh, delivery program is to do product testing. We give out this best identified candidates to our partners for testing in the best commercial markets. And uh, then we work closely with uh, the partners for uh, scaling up and uh, distribution of these seeds to the population and the farmers. We work with them to create uh, marketing and promotional activities. And that's a team which monitors this thing this platform also serves as advocacy and uh, for favorable policies for biofortification. So this is the story of Pearl Miller. The first product uh, uh, was commercialized in partnership with Nirmal Seed in 20, 2012. And by 2018, we have now six iron Pearl Millet hybrids, which is developed in partnership with Ecrisat and National Agriculture System, which are in the range of 65 to 74 ppm. 
The target is 77 ppm, so the breeding program has been able to achieve about 94 to 95% of the targets. So we work uh, very closely with the partners for creating <coughs> promotional activities, large farmers. We worked with Nirmal Seed in Maharashtra across uh, doing, implementing more than 150 marketing uh, meetings. And that's one of the uh, uh, way of creating awareness uh, uh, among the farmers, large farmers meeting, small farmers meeting, <coughs> engaging uh, the retailers and the distributors and uh, training the retailers and distributors because retailers and distributors are the primary uh, 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 points where the farmers go and buy the seed. We have also uh, done a, a, a small uh, uh, wheat flour testing in Punjab two years back to understand uh, the major drivers and barriers of zinc wheat. Apart from that, we work, the, we work with our partners very closely in creating communication materials and uh, seed package design designing, we have been able to create a logo which goes with the seed pack with our partners, with all the biofortified crops. Uh, it's uh, initial stages of creating a branding. We still need to invest a lot on this, but it's the initial way that we started of doing. It also creates a kind of a trust of quality uh, in terms of farmers to understand that this is biofortified crops. <coughs> but whereas in Africa, if you were to look at, there are different ways of promotion. <coughs> In Nigeria, the, like our Bollywood, Hollywood, they have a Nollywood, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, they <coughs> have been able to release three movies, uh, uh, <coughs> movies which shows the benefits about uh, biofortified crops. And that's this has been very famous. It ran uh, for about three or four months continuously in uh, some of the major cities in, um, in, uh, in Nigeria. In Rwanda, for example, uh, the promotions are done more of a, like a hip-hop music songs, rock songs, and that's how they have been communicating with them. So uh, in India, we have been following a cost-effective way because, uh, uh, you know, seed companies have a large distribution touch points and they have been able to reach the backyard of farmers. So that's a different way of promotion in India. So the nutrition studies uh, in pearl millet and, um, uh, and wheat has been established. In, uh, in pearl millet is established that uh, it helps in improving the cognitive function in school going children and it meets about 100% of the daily requirement. Whereas in zinc wheat uh, biofortified, uh, it's been able to establish that it increases the micronutrient status and, uh, at, and it uh, reduces the morbidity, especially in school, school children. This was done in Delhi and uh, the, the, the uh, pearl millet nutrition study was done in Maharashtra. So Harvest Plus also has developed an interactive tool <coughs> which, which gives you a kind of uh, information on the highest rate of returns in a, a particular crop, in a particular uh, 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 geography. So uh, that helps uh, the investor to invest on which crop, which geography. So what is the progress of, uh, to, to this data? <coughs> the Harvest Plus, uh, along with the partners, have been able to create a platform initial platform, or that's what I would like to say, a private-public partnership uh, with about 70 partners that we work largely from uh, state agriculture universities, uh, private seed companies, uh, NGOs, uh, community organizations. Uh, we have uh, 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 been able to train uh, uh, dealers and retailers, especially in the geographies that we work in Maharashtra, Eastern UP, and some parts of Bihar. Uh, ICR has initiated a biofortification platform. I think so. Uh, they invest about 200 crores, I suppose, five year. This, this is the second phase of the uh, biofortification program. ICR also has initiated a special testing and evaluation module for biofortified crops. That's especially in rice and wheat. <coughs> and, uh, and in pearl millet, uh, uh, six hybrids and one OPVs has been released till now. The trickle-down effect of uh, research that we have done in India uh, has some impact in Africa too. In Africa, they have uh, released one, uh, the first, bi in fact, the first biofortified pearl millet in Africa this year. And, uh, <coughs> and in wheat, in wheat, there are two official releases, one from Punjab Agriculture University and one from Karnal. And uh, four varieties have been commercialized with the seed companies. And this is the first, uh, we have a, also a small investment that we do on three other crops, that is uh, sorghum, lentil, and cowpeas. So last year, the first uh, sorghum biofortified variety has been released last year. 
Apart from that, apart from that ICR, especially the pearl millet, pearl millet uh, improvement program, for the first time, I think so the first time globally, where a biofortification standard has been established for product release. That means it has a minimum standard. So any product which doesn't qualify will not be released. So this helps a lot in mainstreaming biofortification. It also helps the seed companies to work for this standard for getting the product <coughs> release. The next, please. So what are the next steps of, uh, that we want to focus on is that uh, to focus on, um, on, um, uh, on integration of biofortified crops into the value chain. Uh, intensify, intensify promotions to build consumer demand. You know, it needs a lot of investment. It also needs a lot of uh, partnership. And uh, uh, the third one is that integrate biofortification into the public and uh, private sector policies. And uh, especially the seed companies have now started investing on biofortification, especially uh, uh, I still uh, about 10 or 15 companies invest largely on developing their own varieties. There are some companies which have made uh, their commitment to the management that they will come out with on their own biofortified varieties. Harvest Plus also works closely with Codex to create a, a food standard, uh, which helps, uh, uh, will help in developing biofortified uh, uh, grain trading system, which at, at this point of time, we do not have a, a food standard for biofortification. And, uh, and, uh, and the last one is that focus on mainstreaming mainstreaming especially into the public breeding program. So after uh, on a long-term basis, any variety which you develop is a biofortified variety. The next one. So we have a, a, a new project which we are focusing on Bihar and Odisha. Uh, we, this is the first year of implementation where the focus crop is zinc wheat, zinc rice, and uh, iron lentils. So the primary objective is to uh, promote and as to, uh, to create value chain uh, sustainability for biofortified crops in in Bihar, uh, for uh, biofortified crops, biofortified and to policy policy advocacy. So, uh, so looking at what are the opportunities for bio biofortified crops, as uh, Professor Prafu Pingali just mentioned, uh, our initial focus has been uh, the initial pathway, developing crops, promoting it, and um, and uh, and creating awareness among the communities so that they they grow and eat consume these crops in order to create household uh, uh, nutrition security but as the farm surpluses as the uh, products are uh, coming out of the stable stables uh, uh, what are, we feel there are two drivers for triggering demand long term demand as you know, uh, the public distribution program or the, uh, the public distribution program procures about 25 to 30 percent of the wheat and rice grains in the country. And uh, as you probably know, millets last year has been incorporated into the public distribution system. Some of the states have started implementing uh, uh, millets into the public, uh, new, uh, public distribution program. For example, Karnataka has implemented ragi the finger millets into the distribution program. Some of the states are still in the design phase. So that's, a, uh, I would say, uh, one of the drivers for biofortified crops. And, uh, and the second one, uh, I would say, is the food uh, partnerships, uh, consumer food uh, partnerships. It could be small, rural, semi-rural, and uh, uh, larger food companies. Uh, as you know, probably uh, Nestle has already uh, launched a product made of fine pearl millet in Ghana. Um, uh, that's Cerilac. And uh, there are uh, some companies in, uh, in Africa which have started uh, uh, making consumer demand. So that's, I, uh, that's at, at, at Harvest Plus, we believe that these are two drivers which we have to focus on in the coming years. Food partnership, we have been working and discussing with some of the food companies to create a partnership. Uh, I remember, I know in Africa, in Nigeria, <coughs> Kellogg's have started sourcing vitamin A grain <coughs> from, uh, to, uh, to, to incorporate as a grain for their uh, cereal breakfast. So there are a lot of other uh, opportunities which are coming up in terms of value, value chain development. The next one. So recently, uh, recently there was a market research uh, published. Uh, the potential uh, biofortification market by 2023 would be more than a hundred million dollars, and uh, at uh, and uh, the potential markets could be uh, India, Brazil, and about four countries in Africa. 
So that's a kind of a biofortification market potentiality uh, from a market research organization. So uh, in the end of 2017, uh, there were about 8 million people and about 33 million people who had access to, to biofortified crops across, uh, across Asia, Africa, and Latin America. 8 million people are the farming communities who grow and who grow biofortified crops directly. In India, uh, uh, iron pearl millet, about 95,000 farmers are cultivating in Maharashtra and parts of Karnataka. And, um, and zinc wheat, approximately 175 to 175,000 farmers are growing in eastern UP and parts of Bihar. So with that, I would like to end my presentation. So this is one of the uh, famous quote by Professor Swaminathan, which says that every farm uh, should family farm should be a biofortified farm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for excellent keynote address. Uh, I'm, I will compliment Harvest Plus for excellent task and then targeted around 1 billion households, farmer household. Uh, they, they are going to have biofortified crops by 2030 when we have to achieve the sustainable development goals. So great achievement and please give a big hand to uh, Binu again. So, and he covered a wide range of issues which are bothering in biofortification as well as you know they are concerning research and development processes. So as uh, chairman's remark, I have to give few remarks. So I'll add, I will just flag five five issues which have emerged during uh, this uh, th small session. One is uh, the dietary patterns are changing, so we need to understand how the dietary patterns in rural areas and urban areas are changing, and how can we increase uh, supply of biofortified uh, crops and create a sustainable market. So this is one. So when we have to go for increased supply, then there should be incentives to the farmers. So there are three conditions. One is it should be more profitable, either through higher productivity or through <coughs> higher prices. So uh, this is first condition for farmers to accept this one. Second is this should be uh, climate resilient. As Binu said that climate change is, great, is emerging and affecting the nutrition as well as um, productivity of the various crops. So this should be climate resilient. And third, there should be a strong seed sector. So there are three conditions when we have to increase supply of uh, these um, biofortified commodities. The second is how can we have product differentiation? This is very critical when we have to promote biofortified crops. So this product differentiate would be needed at, at the level of procurement of these crops uh, and also at the level of retail. So both places we need product differentiation. So role of labeling, role of certification will be very, very important. So that is second issue. And third is uh, the building partnership and bringing all stakeholders at, a, at one platform. I think this, this meeting is one forum where we have tried to bring most of the partners in one forum. Uh, the third one is uh, how we can attract private sector. Private sector both in market research because they can do a better market research for promoting their products. And second, how they can be engaged in more processing of these commodities. Can policies play an important role like incentives, taxes, where we have higher gene, you have less taxes in the processed commodities. So this we, uh, we need to uh, see and, um, and discuss more. And fifth is how we communicate, the communication strategy for promoting biofortified crops. Examples of Africa is very interesting. So here we need uh, different kinds of approaches. We can test, do some experiments, and see that which one is more most, most effective communication strategy. So these are the five points I would like to um, bring before you for this um, morning. I'm very happy that Indian Council of Agriculture Research has also their own biofortification strategy or a biofortification policy. I'm one of the members of the uh, research at Qu uh, QRT, the quinquennial review team of uh, Wheat Research Institute, Wheat and Barley, Dr. Sevaram is here. They have developed several varieties and also released. Uh, we have rice institutions, uh, both in uh, Hyderabad as well as in Katak. They have developed and they are engaged in this one. IRI is engaged in uh, palmillate, lentil, 
and he also in vegetables. So I see, uh, and this uh, central tuber research institutes, they are also involved in uh, biofortification. So I think the CG centers and ICR are complementing their efforts and making more and more investment for biofortified commodities. So with this, thank you very much for this particular session, and I look forward for a very productive day and come out with strong recommendations for future research and policies. Thank you very much.